I am Shami Klenka. I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate at University of Sheffield. So my talk would be on precision microscopy. I called it precision because it's careful examination and using um, quite advanced microstructural techniques in order to uh, determine materials properties. And obviously this is to mark Harry's retirement. Um, um, so I have been a part of the face transformation group from 2016 to 2020. That was the time when I uh, was doing my PhD and I was the PhD number 95 out of his 97 PhD students. Uh, my work was to develop a Bainetic steel with 30 GPA percent characteristics. 30 GP percent means you multiply the strength and ductilities at the ductility uh, strength combination should reach around 30 GPA percent. Um, and obviously like all developing a new steel or a new alloy for varied application, the process as other authors or everyone across the globe um, uses is first of all, doing some simulations. So obviously uh, do a lot of thermodynamic kinetic calculations, uh, even go as close as to predict elongation using percolation theory. Um, I'm not going to say a lot about percolation theory. People can go into my thesis and a lot of Harry's paper where um, how he has used like the connectivity of austenite leading to uh, ductility. And then once that connectivity re reduces to a threshold value of like 10% of austenite left in the microstructure, uh, then failure can start. So those type of, um, those type of uh, logics can be used in order for uh, going into elongation prediction. So these type of work has been done during my PhD. Next step is generally like the uh, laboratory scale alloy development. I'll just... Just put my laser pointer. So uh, laboratory scale alloy development, obviously this was a photograph taken when I was doing a 60 gram melts uh, from whatever calculations I got from the thermocalc and the kinetics data using MUCG and M triple T data. Um, I made the first heat of 60 grams and then we swaged it, uh, we then homogenized it. Um, and then we do a lot of dilatometry using the conventional dilatometers or commercial dilatometers available. And later on going and uh, producing the CCT diagrams for these uh, novel or new alloys that we are trying to do. Uh, so the process is the same. And, and then obviously you reiterate and then you see uh, whether you're getting the microstructure which, which, which you intended at first or not. So it's like a, uh, like a cycle that you have to follow and then, then uh, predictions and the actual experiments should match. Moving on, obviously after that, we go into advanced microstructural characterization. This is one of the steel that I was working on, alloy A, having uh, some amount of pro-eutectoid ferrite and bainite and retained austenite in the optical microstructure. Um, I would like to point out that a, a, a thing that I tried to do was related to hardness entropy, which is uh, a same concept which has been done by uh, Sugden and Badishia. Uh, so this is like how to know about heterogeneity of the microstructure in welds. Uh, so you can actually translate the same concept and using the concept of configurational entropy you can actually uh, indent many micro indents on a particular micrograph, which is segregated and come up with a term analogous to configuration entropy known as the hardness entropy. And from that, the hardness entropy generally varies from between zero to one. And then if a value is more closer to zero, that means the microstructure is more homogeneous, less of segregation. And if it is more closer to one, then it is heterogeneous and lots of segregations are there. Obviously, we do a lot of SEM fractography inclusion analysis. This is one example of uh, aluminum nitride, uh, which uh, I formed in my sample because of uh, high amount of nitrogen in my steel. And you can see beautifully the facets uh, of the hexagonal structure 
of aluminum nitride, which was actually inside a crevice. For example, if you can see this crevice over here, um, it, it was found, found in a factograph like that. Obviously going into lots of EBSD, doing parent grain reconstruction. Nowadays, even like commercial softwares like Aztec, um, uh, by, by Oxford Instruments have this capability of reconstructing um, austenite grain from, um, from the, um, the parent austenite grain from um, bainite or martensite uh, plates. Uh, also, they, they have much more uh, involved like alpha, beta, titanium transformations. Those type of things also are, are, are available. So everything that I'm putting over here is like big, cherry picked from my thesis, whatever I was doing to develop these steels having 30 GPA percent characteristics. Over here is a particular X-ray diffraction um, session that I was doing for deformed austenite and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> obviously the fourth step is then go for mechanical testing, full-fledged ones, and then see whether you have achieved the properties or not. You go back and forth, reiterate it, and uh, finally you you come up with the properties that you need uh, at your final stage. One of the takeaway from my thesis chapter one to chapter seven was this thing which I came up with. Uh, it's, it's important how we can correlate different attributes. For example, in this case, uh, the total free energy to elongation so the total free energy over here, I'm talking about the chemical free energy known as the delta G gamma alpha, which can be um, found out from any um, thermocalc or um, empty data, these type of softwares, you can easily calculate the chemical free energy of transformation between gamma to alpha. And then you have the mechanical free energy um, of, of, of the transformation. So if you add both of them and you find out the total free energy, I was able to find that there was a zone of optimum delta G total where the elongation or the uh, strength ductility combination or the product uh, used to reach the maximum value. So, from, so if you go from, for a delta G which is low, uh, obviously modulus of that, delta G total which is low, then the austenite is more stable and then while deformation, it doesn't transform into martensite and give you the strain hardening required, required for having a higher elongation. What happens when you go at a higher uh, delta G total, um, the modulus of that, what happens is in that case, the austenite is less stable and during a deformation or during a tensile test, um, it, it transforms quite easily to martensite and not giving adequate amount of strain hardening. So I found out that there was a region um, between uh, these two where you can maximize your elongation or you can maximize your strength ductility product. Uh, one should keep in mind that these values, uh, these values could differ uh, depending upon what kind of uh, software you're using. However, the delta G mechanical is more consistent because it's, it depends upon your yield strength of your material. So this is quite, quite constant. But if you change this, depending upon what software you're using, still you will be able to uh, obtain a, 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 a something like an inverted U shape where you can maximize uh, elongation depending where you operate. Uh, your del delta G total. So now this, uh, I'll finish off all my um, things that I wanted to point out from my chapter one to chapter seven of my thesis. Now what I am talking about is my chapter eight, which contains a lot of microscopy over here. So revisiting bainite crystallography is my chapter eight of my thesis. And my first question goes, uh, if anybody can see, what is this? So I'm giving you a hint is that a hint is that it is visualizing the edge of the sample. So if you can see, this is this is the edge of the sample, and what I am seeing over here is a surface one and surface two that are at 90 degrees with each other. Uh, I put it under a sem, uh, and then 
in the first image, the surface one is tilt corrected. That means what you're seeing over here in surface one is actually normal to the electron beam. And in the second image, the surface two is tilt corrected where you are seeing uh, surface two normal to the electron beam in a scanning electron microscope. Obviously, when you are uh, trying to image the edge of a sample, it becomes difficult because of the, of the perspective that you are viewing. That's the reason we need to use tilt correction. But what is this? Actually, this is my first failed sample, uh, which I was trying to do during my, um, uh, during my thesis to form bainite um, and to find few things about it, which Harry and we discussed and I discussed we should go for it. And it, it has a lot of uh, academic significance. So this was martensite when observed through the edge of the sample. So what novelty I wanted to bring in my chapter eight was I wanted to measure all the following of these information one, two, three for a single plate of bainite. Uh, one is the determination of the habit plane. Uh, I wanted to measure the habit plane of bainite. Second, I wanted to measure the orientational relationship and I wanted to measure the shear strain associated due to the shape deformation. So obviously my first test failed. So went on to the drawing board, sample preparation and heat treatments. Over here, the picture is me and with my arch nemesis, which is the sink where I have dropped so many of these samples after completely polishing it. So the main, the main motive of how to make these samples is you have to have surfaces at 90 degrees, metallographically polished, typically to a 0.25 micrometer diamond polish. And there were a lot of these which I dropped into the sink after polishing and having a good surface finish, which was completely useless after that. Now you can put these samples into an encapsulated glass tube with inert argon high purity inert argon so that you remove all the oxygen uh, because you will be doing the heat treatment with these samples. And then generally I wrap these samples with a tantalum foil, which acts as a getter. Uh, you obviously can use these samples in a dilutometer directly as well, but I wanted to avoid uh, spot welding, uh, thermocouples and handling the sample a lot while putting into the dilutometer. That's, therefore I went into, a normal um, muffle furnace oven type of an arrangement to do these heat treatments. Uh, the, the, the chemistry is given over here, uh, nanostructured bainitic steel. Um, many of these uh, um, com compositions will be available in Harry's book and everywhere in the literature. The heat treatment was just, obviously these are approximate values because I was operating in a furnace. Mm. However, just take it to 1050 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes for homogenization and it is completely austenite. And then you bring it down to a 400, 450 degrees Celsius where you keep it for two, two and a half hours to three hours and then cool it down to room temperature. So after a lot of these preparations, this is how a single plate of bainite looks. And uh, it's the same thing that I was doing, but that, that was martensite in my case, but this is the reference surface one and the section surface two, which I'm continuing as surface one and surface two. Now you can see this plate of bainite, and then you just have to find the habit plane of it. So it's quite geometrical right now. So you know, know the trace of the, um, uh, the plate of uh, bainite on one surface, like surface one, that is, T11, and you know the trace of it on the, on the uh, orthogonal uh, surface, which is T21. And you know that the angle subtended um, uh, by T11 and T21 to the edge of the sample is theta1 and theta2. This is uh, uh, the same plate of bainite at higher uh, magnification in order to do an EBSD of that plate. Now it's time for some calculations. So what we do to find out the habit plane of this plate of uh, bainite that I uh, found. So it's, we, we know the traces of it, T11 and T21. So uh, just you convert it into, and you know the angles that it subtends to the edge of the sample. So T11 is given by the vector that, and T22, T, T21 is cos theta two plus uh, uh, cross theta two zero sine theta two. So it follows from here that uh, you can just um, put in the values of theta one and theta two into that equation, and then you get the traces in the sample frame. 
the cross product of this will give you the normal to the uh, to that plate and that will be the habit plane in the sample frame from the so this is i'm talking about this term as uh, t1 t21 cross t11 which gives you a value of this and you know that uh, from from ebsd you know that gamma js which is the orientation with respect to the specimen axis and then you just multiply it with the uh, vector and then you get the uh, get the gamma in in um, in the uh, the p1 in the gamma frame so this was the uh, the habit plane that i got so what next i i i have i have i've got the habit plane so let's let's uh, let's do uh, more detailed analysis of the same thing uh, obviously i know the orientational relationship and the habit plane now so if you see the black uh, the black dots are uh, or the black data points are from uh, the gamma uh, and the red ones are from alpha so i know the orientational relationship in this case uh, which is irrational obviously however we can see uh, that the closely packed planes of gamma and alpha like that is bar 1 bar 1 1 gamma um, is almost parallel to uh, bar 1 1 uh, 0 alpha so you can see this this portion like the closely packed planes are almost parallel and the closely packed directions that are lying on those closely packed planes are also um like almost parallel not not following a kuznov sachs or nishiyama wasserman uh, 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 type of orientation relationship it is uh, irrational but it is almost following those now um this is where the habit plane of the plate of bainite obviously why why there are many data points is to take care of the of the error in ebsd measurement so the spread that you are seeing is actually the error in measuring uh, um, orientations through the ebsd technique so this is the habit plane that i found for that plate of um, uh, bainite now you you can closely see that the uh, this is by Srinivasan and um, Wayman, I guess. Uh, so they found out that the 557 is actually the habit plane for martensite, which is this green hollow dot, which you can see over here. So from this one pole figure, obviously, I, I know from, from the first analysis that the orientational relationship is, is irrational and almost following um, KS or NW. And I have found out the habit plane, which is quite close to the 557 um, habit plane of, of, uh, of martensite. But we have not finished yet. Uh, we need to find out one more thing. Uh, we already found out the habit plane. We already found out the orientational relationship. But now we need to find out uh, the, the shape deformation, the, the, the value of it, the, the, the shear strain value of it. So, I took the same sample and put it under uh, atomic force microscopy, and you can see um, this is this is how it looks under the uh, uh, in a two dimensional and three dimensional, and then you can see that plate over here, and I just uh, uh, found out a line profile between point A to point B, which looks something like over here, which is the horizontal distance in micrometers with the vertical distance, which you are seeing the surface relief due to the formation of bainite. And you can easily know which portion is a gamma and which portion is a uh, bainite and then compute the shear strain. Now, uh, the shear strain that I computed from uh, AFM technique were, came out to be 0 0.24. So my motive of of doing this, this three measurements on a single plate of bainite was obviously successful at this stage, but now we need to compare with literature. Let's go to, let's go to geometry of crystals. Uh, obviously the new edition page 219. If you go to that and you find uh, Harry's calculation on uh, to calculate the shear strain associated with the Martin site, uh, using the phenomenological uh, theory of uh, Martin said, you will find that uh, the delta, which is the normal strain, is somewhere around 0 0.03, and uh, the, the um, shear strain component is 0 
and what I got was 0.24. So thanks God, I was not that way off from what Harry predicted in his book, sorry, or calculated in his book. Obviously one point doesn't uh, cater to everything. So I had to do another point. So this is another plate of uh, uh, abenite, and this time uh, I think the microstructure was better than the previous one because I guess I have gained some experience in terms of how to do these tests. So again, the same thing, just uh, get the values of T11, T21, and then go ahead with doing the EBSD of it, do the AFM of the same plate, um, so this is this is the uh, edge of the sample, and I am measuring a plate of uh, bainite over here. This is the EBSD where the same plate has been zoomed and done an EBSD of it. Uh, the same way to do an AFM where you do a line scan between point A to B, taking into the, the, the surface relief into account, and then you find out the horizontal distance and the vertical distance, and you find out uh, which portion is the gamma and alpha V. Over here, um, I have missed out. I think the value came out to be 0.22. The true strain, I have not put it over here, but then uh, this was another uh, plate that I, I did it during my PhD. So uh, it is now important for me to correlate this with literature. So all the black dots are the three plates that I have done in my PhD, P1, uh, P2, and P3. Uh, the, the uh, diamond um, gray is uh, from, I guess, Srinivasan and uh, Wayman, where they have, they have found out for uh, uh, the habit plane of Martensite alpha prime, I think it was 557. So that has been plotted. And the other work that has been done in literature where they have, they have, uh, uh, they have used, they have not used this technique, but they have just found out the habit plane uh, using whatever two surface analysis um, or whatever way they have chosen. Um, and, and these are some of the points which, which are like scattered around in and around what I have got through. So you can go into my thesis and look, and look into these references and then just check out what their habit plane uh, was with respect to what I have calculated using this uh, two surface analysis. Uh, here um, I'm just just uh, putting the, uh, the the three plates that I have got, um, which which has uh, uh, the habit plane as irrational and it is um, so sorry the orientational relationship as irrational, and it is not exactly following KS relationship or NW, but it is something like around five to three degrees away from KS relationship and something like one to two degrees away from. Uh, Nishiyama and Possumman's uh, orientational relationship. So why I am putting this on? Why, why did I choose to show this um, as one of my favorite, favorite part of my thesis? It's because this is where I actually um, took up that knack of using microscopy in, in my later uh, postdoc that I am doing. Um, so this is, this is my inspiration. And then I, I found uh, precision microscopy or microscopy as such very exciting. And whatever I'm going to show next is the current work that I am doing um, in this field. So current precision and in-situ microscopy work, um, as, as I told, I am I'm in University of Sheffield currently and my co-partners are from University of Leeds. Um, also, uh, this is a EPSRC funded uh, friction grant program. You can find all the related information on that website given. So it's a consortium of a lot, lot of PhD students, uh, postdocs and academic staffs who are trying to solve uh, or demystify friction as a whole. Uh, on, the, on the right hand side, this is my lab, Nanolab Sheffield. We have a uh, lot of uh, fancy equipments which we use, and I will show one of them during my presentation, um, where uh, where we where we use these in order to uh, characterize um, various different aspects of uh, coatings, maybe battery uh, particles, corrosion layers, um, something like chromium cobalt moly alloys. So it it has it, it spreads the usability of these advanced equipments is quite numerous. So 
we, we were working working on silenized coatings. So what you're seeing over here is an unsilenized stainless steel substrate. And you can see the water droplet is not uh, moving around as a globule. But on the second sample, which is salinized, you can easily see the water droplet moving around quite easily because the surface of, uh, of the second sample, which is salinized, is hydrophobic in nature. So salinization is actually a process in which you uh, modify the surface characteristics of any, of any sample in order to make it either uh, uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. So it's, it's, it's salinization makes it hydrophobic in nature. So over here on the left-hand side, you're seeing an unsalinized stainless steel coupon, uh, just bare metal. And the other one is a salinized coating, which, which, which is hydrophobic in nature. This video was uh, provided to me uh, by Dr. Weipin Go and Professor Mojaba Gadiri uh, from University of Leeds. Uh, my main motive over here was to um, understand the friction of these coating and how silent coating uh, is, affecting, is, is, is affecting friction. What you're seeing over here is that same um, stainless steel coupon. One is salinized and one is unsalinized. Um, and then I have attached a glass bead, which is a counter surface. Um, and I am doing a friction test inside a scanning electron microscope. Um, I will go with whatever the installation of this uh, attachment is to a scanning electron microscope. But over here, what you can see, there's this glass bead which is stuck to a probe. Um, and this is the stainless steel coupon, which is salinized and unsalinized. And you can see the, uh, the substrate moving um, relatively to the glass bead. And we can do all kinds of uh, mm, different types of uh, profiles of uh, tests. For example, over here, if you take, I am uh, ramping up the load for in 10 seconds from zero to 50 millinewton, holding that load for uh, 50 seconds and then unloading um, it in next 10 seconds. So it is type of a loading curve that I'm giving to the sample. And with that, I'm also doing a scratch, which starts after the loading has been complete to 15 millinewton. And then I do a scratch of 500 micrometers in a duration of 50 seconds and load it down. So it's it's something like I'm applying a normal force to the sample and I am doing a scratch test or a friction test where the uh, sample is moving relative to the, uh, to the uh, top indenter. In this case, the indenter is my glass bead. So I did a lot of these tests. So you can just, uh, so it, it, it operates, it has, um, quite a low, um, it can go to very low uh, values of forces. So it can go up to like 50 millinewtons, 100 millinewtons and 300 millinewtons. I did some tests on these, uh, uh, these profiles. And uh, we, we get um, normal forces, lateral forces. And then from that, you can easily compute uh, the coefficient of friction. So what I'm, what I'm dealing over here right now is, if you see the 50 millinewton, this is the unsalinized sample. Obviously you can see the loading curve, which is uh, not the uh, setup curve, but, but the uh, curve that has been um, generated through the transducers. Uh, so it is uh, recorded through the, um, the uh, acquisition system. So the orange curve, what you're seeing is loading to 50 millinewton. Uh, and holding that there for like uh, 50 seconds and then unloading it. And uh, the lateral forces are uh, measured using that instrument, which has a piezoelectric transducer and that can convert into uh, lateral forces. So over here, you see, uh, uh, obviously there is, uh, so the, 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 right, the left-hand side is for the normal force uh, uh, scale bar um, scale and the right hand side is the lateral force and then we found out a coefficient of friction of 0 0.24 uh, obviously this is an averaged out uh, coefficient of friction you can get instantaneous coefficient of friction um, as well um, so so I, I did this for the unsalinized part and the salinized part obviously you can see the coefficient of friction for the salinized coating is lower than uh, the unsalinized coating. Uh, so we repeated the tests. Obviously, this is not just, I'm just plotting over here is one test. 
but this was quite consistent uh, uh, with all the 10 number of tests to have statistical uh, significant value of coefficient of friction. So all those, all those have been done. Uh, now we move on to a hundred millinewton test. It, it is almost following the same trend. You can see um, loading up to hundred millinewton holding for 50 seconds and then unloading it. And then what the coefficient of friction you're getting is 0 0.29. And for salinized coating, it is uh, 0 0.17. Now we let's, let's move on to a 300 millinewton test. Um, again, very similar values of coefficient of friction, 0 0.26. Um, for the unsalinized one and uh, 0.18 for the salinized one. You can see uh, uh, this is one of the scratch uh, that I have done. And you can see how the damage on the surface of the sample can be, can be seen. Obviously this silane coating is not that thick. It is, uh, it might be a few monolayers or it is quite thin. So once you do a, a scratch test, obviously that is getting eroded, but then you can do these tests at different portion of the sample in order to have uh, always a new fresh of silane coating at that, at that place. Obviously we need to have statistical significant data. So uh, after collating uh, everything, the coefficient of friction for salinized uh, stainless steel coupons are uh, less as compared to uh, the one that is for unsalinized one or the bare one. So obviously it is consistent like for 50 millinewton, 100 millinewton and 300 millinewton of normal loads. Um, obviously there is a, a trend that you are seeing that at higher loads, the coefficient of friction is higher. Um, what we think this is generally for uh, um, because because the, the instrument that I'm using works as a feedback loop. So I think it is more, uh, more sensitive to pick up higher loads as compared to higher lateral forces as compared to lower lateral forces. Maybe that's one of the, one of the reasons that we are seeing an increment of, uh, of coefficient of friction as we, as we increase the, the normal load. Um, Apart from that, we don't, don't have any other explanation. Uh, but yeah, uh, what, what tests I am doing over here in, in situ is, is to understand, understand uh, the damage mechanism as we visualize it. So one of the, one of the main uh, motive of doing these precision microscopy at University of Sheffield and Nanolab um, is, is to understand the damage mechanism that is uh, that is there in when, when you do a lot of uh, these scratch tests or indentation or even tensile tests. Obviously, these are all miniature samples. And when you, when you scale it up to uh, bigger samples where you use more uh, conventional, uh, higher load um, instron uh, ten, ten, tensile testing machines, um, it, might, it might vary. But obviously, it will give you an idea, provided all the experiments that you do is within the same same parameters. So this is one of the work that I, I, I am showing you. Other in-situ characterization work uh, that I am involved with um, is micropillar compression. So uh, this is, um, I was doing a micropillar compression for chromium cobalt moly alloy. This is uh, a medical grade alloy, which is generally used for uh, hip replacements. And obviously, um, how these chromium cobalt moly alloy perform uh, during uh, service. For example, if somebody has gone through that surgery and has replaced his hip with a chromium cobalt moly alloy, then um, it, needs to, it needs to have a life uh, because that same person need not to go another surgery in order to, if, if that alloy wears off because there are body fluids and a lot of things that it, it encounters while in service. So this work was majority to understand how the wear properties are. So uh, we use this, uh, again, the same uh, attachment inside a scanning electron microscope and we have wear tracks on it. This is the base uh, chromium cobalt moly, moly alloy and we have flat punches and we, uh, we use it to compress. And then what we get is um, a nice little uh, a snapshot or a video of how that, uh, pillar is getting compressed 
and then you can you can also get all all sorts of data like engineering stress strain curves under compression under uniaxial compression uh, over here you can see there is a slip band formation and there is offset um, of the top part of the pillar to the bottom part um, so yeah, uh, these, these methodologies can be used a lot in order to feed in uh, models like in Abacus where you want to give uh, um, like flow curves for different uh, phases or so, so it has a lot of usability. Mm. And then you can scale it up uh, doing much more uh, like compression tests on, on samples which are of large scale on bigger machines. But this actually gives you a visualization as well as you get the response of stress strain curve, which is quite remarkable. Sure, Mike, we're approaching uh, seven minutes to the end of time, yeah? Just so you know. So, uh, so I have seven minutes more left? Yeah, if you don't have any questions, then yeah, you have okay. seven minutes. So, so, so also uh, doing a lot of in-situ indentation where you just uh, break particles get the particle fracture loads. Uh, these are some of the work that I'm involved with. Uh, now, uh, this is a typical um, scratch test or a much more of a grooving test that was done on a titanium 6-4 alloy. Uh, the the, the left-hand side I'm talking about here, you have a conical tip and it's just moving across and creating damage. And then you can visualize the damage and get the data out of the system as well. Um, this is another uh, corrosion layer, a scratch test where you can see the tip moving across the facet of facets of the crystals. These are lots of in situ scratch tests that you can that you can do. So this is the this is the um, apparatus I was talking about. It's the alumnus, which we put it in a Nova NanoSim or a Helios Fib, depending upon what you want to do. You can go onto their website. It's quite quite remarkable. This instrument is. And then it gives you a lot of control over what you want to achieve. You can do nano indentation. You have all different kinds of tips, starting with Berkovich, um, Vickers, a cube corner, any 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 type of uh, tips that you want to use. So yes, so so my my uh, it has been a it's quite a quite a fascinating journey with microscopy and doing these these remarkable things for different alloys. So I, I will I will I will like to say thank you. Sorry for uh, getting beyond the thirty minutes time limit. I guess I I I, I explained too much. Maybe uh, finally, Harry. I hope you have uh, a post retirement plan of whatever eighty one books you want to write comes true, uh, and I always get a signed copy of it in future. Um, and and I wish you a very happy retirement.